Hello everyone, I can see people logging on, um, so we're delighted that you're joining us. We have over a thousand students from all over the island of Ireland, and I'm going to do a quick shout out to them in a few minutes, but that's why I'm just going to delay the presenters um, for a couple of minutes because I can see people are quickly and furiously logging on, um, but we're waiting on a few more. Um, just a little bit of background. My name is Eta McGuigan, and um, I'm the Science and Engineering Promotion Officer in Maynooth University. Delighted that we're joined by Professor uh, Peter and Dr. John Regan from Theoretical Physics this morning, a part of our Science Week. And we've had huge outreach activities all week, and this is our last, and maybe John and Peter would argue the best. So you're getting the, the best for last, saving the best for last. So um, we're very excited. Uh, the outline of today's um, webinar, our a masterclass is on screen at the minute, but um, Peter will talk in more detail about that. But just before I hand over to Peter, I just want to do a quick shout out to some of the counties that are involved. And of course, I am not biased, but I would have to start, you might guess with an accent like this, is from Monaghan. So we're delighted, St. McCartan's and Colossus Oriel, Falsh Galair, on Shahan Yu. And uh, will cap them hopefully by uh, one of us uh, we're invited I'm also joined by Mercy College Sligo um, I see uh, Arklow uh, Wicklow St Joseph's Lucan St Joseph's Rochford Bridge we're in, uh, also joined by St Mel's College Longford we've got students from Drogheda, Nina, Galway, Waterford, Waterford, uh, Loretto Abbey Secondary School, Cork, uh, Davis College, Mount Melick and Leash, Santa Sabina, and St. Mark's and Tala. Um, I've, I could probably actually go on for the next hour and a half calling out the, the schools here. Um, and Peter and John might uh, actually, they're co hosts also, they might stop me or put me on mute. Um, so you're all very, very welcome. Also, schools from, I think, every, I went through this last night, and I think we're hitting every county in Ireland, and Falsha in particular to the Aran Islands also. Um, so with that, and John and Peter, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm in the background. I should say that we are recording this. It, I will email the links to all registered schools over the next, hopefully today or, or um, on Monday. Um, no faces will be shown throughout this, so please rest assured um, we're complying with all GDPR. And um, yeah, I'll send over the link to you. And I, I would encourage you also to use the chat box, the Q&A session there. I think that's all from myself, Peter, but maybe if I have forgotten anything, um, maybe maybe you would include it. So thanks very much and uh, buon tat and Okay, thank, thank you, Ito. We're going to get started shortly. I just wanted to say a couple of things about um, the, the programme. So as you can see from the, the published programme there, we, we have uh, a couple of 20-minute uh, talks uh, about science. So these are ba basically... Uh, I talk might I'll start off talking about cosmology and then John Regan will talk about black holes and uh, that is to highlight some of the research that we do here in the Department of Theoretical Physics here at Maynooth and it's also partly that and partly because uh, this as Ita said this is science week and we want to talk about science and uh, these are two very exciting uh, areas in modern science and uh, very active areas for research, not only here in Maynooth, but everywhere around the world. So I want to talk about those. Um, and then there'll be a short break, um, uh, just so you can stretch your legs or whatever. Uh, and then we'll have a, um, a little talk by um, one of our current students, Lucy, who's there on camera. Okay, give us a wave, Lucy. Uh, there we are. And um, uh, that would basically be about her experiences here as a student in Maynooth. And then very quickly, uh, we'll have uh, a summary of uh, various ways you can study the subjects that we've been talking about in the presentations um, uh, here at Maynooth. We'll end uh, promptly at quarter to 12, in case any of you have got anywhere to go afterwards. Um, and uh, uh, that will end with a question and answer session. But we will have questions on the science part, the first part of the talk, as we go along. So if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer, we'll, we'll try and answer those, uh, at least a couple of them, as we go through the main talks. Um, but um, 
Uh, there's a longer question and answer session at the end, and we'll try and answer the remaining questions then. But remember, you can ask us about the science at the end or anything to do with um, studying physics, theoretical physics, uh, or astrophysics or cosmology uh, at Maynooth, or indeed uh, generally, and however you uh, think you might be uh, interested in studying. It. Sorry, Peter, can I just um, ask, we had a couple of um, questions in to say that people are having difficulty hearing us. Um, I'm not sure if it is on the school end. Um, I know Peter and myself are in different areas of country and I can hear you perfectly. So maybe we'd ask schools maybe just to put in um, just a, a, a question or an answer. Um, can you hear us okay? Uh, or maybe put up your raise your hand. Use a raise the hand button if you can hear us okay. Oh, I've got a message in sounds fine. So thank you, PC4. I'm not sure. Oh, thank you, P Carberry, loud and clear. That's great. So apologies to two schools that couldn't hear us. Maybe log out and maybe log back in. I think the issues at your end. Sorry about that, Peter. Thank you. No, no that's fine. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the internet is a very complicated thing and, and only takes a little bit of it somewhere to not work correctly and the sound can get a bit choppy. So um, let's let's go on, and I'm going to go through. So I'm the I'm the first um, presenter here. So I'm going to uh, start talking about cosmology, and I'll talk for about twenty minutes. Um, so let me get going. Um, I thought I'd start by us uh, by basically saying what cosmology actually is. Cosmology is uh, the study of the universe. That is everything exists that exists um, as a single system. So it's not about the study of the individual parts, the individual planets, stars, and galaxies, so much as the as the entirety of everything understood as a, as a system in itself. So um, it's a little bit different from other branches of astrophysics and and uh, astronomy in the sense that you get astronomers who will study stars or galaxies or whatever, planets, uh, as individual things because they're interesting in themselves, but we study uh, everything put together. So it's a rather ambitious subject, but it's, it's an interesting one. And, uh, and uh, let me take you through one aspect of it that we were researching uh, here in Maynooth. So here is a picture of a galaxy. This is the Andromeda Nebula, our nearest. We live in a thing like this, actually, uh, about 100,000 million stars. And I've gone ahead too quickly. Um, so the, uh, you know, each, uh, this is made of many, many, many billions of stars. And uh, we live in an object like this, but we can't see it so well because we're stuck inside it. And it's full, you can see it's all these dark bands, it's full of dust and stuff that gets in the way. But if we look at uh, another galaxy, we can see something pretty much the same shape as us. Now for a cosmology, so, so lots of astronomers study these objects because they're interesting, their dynamics, the way the stars interact with each other, the way they rotate is really interesting. But for a cosmologist like myself, a galaxy is essentially an atom. The universe is made of basic building blocks this big. Uh, and let me, show you what I mean by cosmology. This is actually an old picture, but a very beautiful one. This is a part of the northern sky with all the stars removed. And all you can see in this picture, there's about uh, 800,000 galaxies, like the one I just showed you. you. Most of them are much further away, of course. And you can see what the structure of the universe looks like on the very large scales from this map. This is an old map from the 1960s. It was done by two astronomers, Shane and Vertanen, counting galaxies on photographic plates for years, literally for years. And they came up with this map, which shows that galaxies are not just smoothly spread throughout the universe. They're actually clumpy in distribution. They have um, very dense clusters like this one in the middle here, which is called the Coma Cluster, and then various sort of filamentary kind of impression you get is like soap suds or something like that. So that's the large scale structure of the universe. And uh, one of our uh, aims in cosmology is to try and understand this, what's called the cosmic web, which is why the galaxies form this amazing structure. And these structures I'll explain later, are you know, hundreds of millions of light years in length, these filaments and chains of galaxies. So it really is a large uh, scale we're talking about. And in order to study it, of course, we have to 
basically take the building blocks to be quite big, in other words, individual galaxies. Now that's that picture there, oops, just shows you uh, the distribution of galaxies on the sky, because back in the 60s, we couldn't measure distances to galaxies in large numbers very easily at all. The key to progress, however, we have to go back a little bit to the 1920s. This guy on the left with the funny trousers is a guy called Edwin Hubble, and he uh, took some measurements, uh, uh, estimated the distance to galaxies, or as they were called in those days, nebulae, uh, spiral nebulae, and he measured the uh, the distance as accurately as he could. Um, you see, I don't know if you can read this, but this is 10 to the six parsecs. That's one million parsecs, a megaparsec, two megaparsec. A megaparsec is an astronomer's unit. Uh, it's a, a parsec is about three light years. So a megaparsec is three million light years. By modern standards, these are very nearby galaxies and it includes the Andromeda Nebula. Um, and he plotted the uh, distance against, uh, the, uh, and up here, um, the apparent uh, recession velocity, the speed of the galaxies. You can measure how quickly galaxies are moving. I'll show you that in a minute. And he got this rather ropey graph. This is kind of as good as the ones that I used to get in physics um, labs at school, actually, uh, with a lot of scatter in it. But basically what happens is that the further away the galaxies are along here, the, um, the more, uh, the faster they seem to be um, moving away from the observer. Let me just show you how that's done. Um, so this is schematically, this is the only equation in this talk, by the way. The velocity is proportional to the distance and the proportionality is called the Hubble constant, big, uh, important number in cosmology. So it's like you're sitting here and the galaxies are all moving away from you. And the further away they are, the faster they're moving. That's Hubble's law. So it's schematically like this. Now, um, uh, that makes it look as if we're the center of the universe and everything's trying to get away from us, which is actually not the right interpretation because if we were to move to, so we're at rest on this little black dot here, if we were to move to this galaxy, we would see our galaxy, uh, the one that we were previously in, moving in the opposite direction, and we would consider ourselves to be the center of expansion. Whichever galaxy you sit on, everything is moving away from that galaxy. So everything is expanding from everything else. Uh, we just look like we're in the center because we're at rest on our particular galaxy. How do you measure it? Well, what you do is you take a, uh, you point your telescope at a galaxy. Here's a nearby one in the Virgo cluster. And you split the light up into its component wavelengths. And those wavelengths uh, 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 get shifted towards the red if the galaxy is actually moving. It's like a Doppler shift. And you can see here, there's two dark bands in the spectrum of this galaxy here. There's a more distant galaxy, a more distant, and an even more distant galaxy. And you see these two dark bands in the spectrum are moving towards longer wavelengths. So these are uh, in the blue part of the spectrum from this galaxy, and in the red part of the distant one. So, these, that's how you can tell whether a galaxy is moving or not, Hubble's law, by spectroscopy, splitting the light into its component wavelengths and looking to see how the characteristic uh, emission from that galaxy changes. Okay, now, if we believe Hubble's law, we can then use this uh, thing to measure uh, the, the redshift, to measure the distance. And this was one of the first uh, plots I was given when I started my PhD years ago. Uh, so you are here at the bottom of this slice of the pie, and we're looking out into space, uh, and we're looking measuring the velocities of, velo of galaxies. So these are in kilometers a second. And notice Hubble's plot that was sort of 1,000 kilometers a second. This is 5,000 kilometers a second, 10,000, 15,000. So we're going much further than Hubble, and we can actually see that this a slice, this is a very thin slice on the sky, the galaxies are forming this sort of bubbly, frothy network. Now we know much more now, cut, to the, you know, cut out 20 or 30 years, and uh, we now have huge surveys of galaxies. We are here, and then we're plotting the positions of galaxies out in using the redshift to measure the uh, distance, to estimate the distance. And we can now go out to um, 
and a thousand megaparsec, that's a gigaparsec, a thousand times further than Hubble was able to, to measure. And there's the cosmic web. Okay, so mapping the cosmic web is really important thing. And we've done, we spent a lot of time in cosmology trying to develop the technology to be able to map the redshifts of galaxies and see how they're distributed in space. But perhaps even more fascinating than that, there's the, this whole uh, adventure is underpinned by a cosmic web of ideas, but that's where the theory comes in. So how do we explain this large scale structure of the galaxy, of, of the distribution of galaxies? Well, we need to put a whole lot of physics together in order to try and understand that. So some of the uh, buzzwords here are general relativity, that, that will come up in John's talk as well. The Big Bang Theory, that's what we think caused the, uh, the universe to be expanding now. Um, to make those galaxies clump together the way they do, there needs to be a lot of material to cause strong enough gravity, uh, so that we think there's dark matter. We think the universe began in a very peculiar way, accelerating really, really quickly. And we also have a more modern addition, which is called dark energy. So there are many concepts here, and I can't go through all of them in the short talk like this. But let me just pay tribute to the heroes of the development of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, uh, so you'll recognize the guy on the left, which is Albert Einstein, who invented the theory of gravity, general relativity that we use in cosmology to try and understand how things interact with each other on these very large scales. And then the two people who independently in the 1920s derived from Einstein's theory what we now call the Big Bang model. And this is the Russian, Alexander Friedman, and the Belgian, uh, Georges Lemaitre. You know, Georges Lemaitre is actually a Catholic priest. Uh, um, and so they're, they're two very different uh, people, um, but they independently derived what we call uh, the Big Bang model. So what is actually happening here is that if you take a galaxy at a very large distance, the light, oh, oops, the light from that galaxy travels through a universe which is itself expanding. So space itself is expanding. Uh, and that is what's, in a sense, what's carrying the galaxies away from each other. Uh, light is made of uh, uh, little packets called photons, and those have a given wavelength. And as they travel through the expanding universe, that wavelength gets stretched. And that's the explanation for the for Hubble's law that we now have uh, in terms of our general relativistic cosmology model, cosmological models. It's, it's actually a very simple concept. Astonishingly, uh, we can now, with, with um, uh, observational facilities like the Hubble telescope, see so far out into space that we can see galaxies, all these things in this picture apart from one or two stars, which you can see by the diffraction pattern. They're all galaxies like our own Milky Way. And we're seeing them at redshifts of 10. So we're seeing them back at a time when the universe was compressed by a factor of 10 compared with what it is now. So we're looking through these galaxies at the very early stages of the expansion of the universe. And galaxies then were very different from what they are now. They're old and rather tired now. Back then, they were very uh, youthful and vigorous and actually a bit smaller as well. Now, if we take this logic on, we'll find that uh, can we go back further than a redshift 10? Well, in fact, an accidental discovery in the 1960s allowed us to take, uh, uh, take us back to the early universe, not by a factor of 10 by looking at galaxies, but by a factor of 1,000 by looking at a source of radiation accidentally discovered using this antenna uh, in New Jersey in uh, America by two men, uh, Penzias and Wilson. They were actually doing an experiment to do with satellite communications. And they discovered there's a very faint but uh, very significant background of radiation in the microwave part of the spectrum. So that's, that's kind of centimeter wave, wavelengths, much longer wavelength than, than light, optical light. And they won the Nobel Prize for that in 1978. Um, and what this is, is, we now think, is uh, uh, radiation that comes from the really, really early, early stages of the, the Big Bang, when the whole universe was as hot as the surface of a star, uh, like our, a star like our sun. So the whole um, 
galaxy was a plasma, the whole universe was a plasma um, radiating uh, high energy radiation, but as, as it's expanded and cooled, that radiation is left over, but is much cooler now than it originally was. It's now only about three degrees above absolute zero if you talk about its temperature. It was produced when the universe was thousands of times hotter than that. And we now, this was basically what convinced people about the Big Bang. So there's a, just a beautiful plot of the spectrum. That if you uh, try to make a thermal radiation spectrum in the, in the laboratory, it's actually quite hard and the universe has done it almost perfectly. Um, right, so what we do using these observations is to try and, uh, so we know the universe now, it's got this radiation in it, it's got matter, it's got galaxies, it's got the cosmic web. Cosmology is a very backward subject because we can, own, we can observe from now. We can't go and visit the early universe ourselves and poke around in it like you can in a laboratory experiment. We have to try and piece together what actually happened in the beginning from what we see now and using what we know about physics. So we're turning the clock back. We can actually make a model of how the universe evolved from its current state with this three degree background radiation in it and some galaxies and stars and all the rest of it and work out what, how we got there from the very beginning. And that's a very successful theory. And see, we now go from, we now think the universe is about, uh, say, uh, 10, uh, 14 billion years old. Um, uh, the oldest stars are roughly that age, and uh, there's very good reasons for thinking that's what the, how old the universe is. And we can push our understanding back to a fraction of a second from the point where everything was actually infinitely uh, compressed together in the Big Bang. So I'll just say a little thing about the microwave background. I, I'm conscious of time. Um, the phrase Big Bang is something which confuses people, I think, quite a lot. So uh, in the early days, uh, 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 Lemaitre and uh, Friedman postulated a universe which was uh, totally smooth and featureless. So it's basically filled with a uniform distribution of matter, no galaxies, no clumps or anything like that. But uh, a universe like that didn't really have a bang because if I do this, the reason you hear that is that when I make clap my hands, I set up oscillations in the air and that pro those oscillations propagate in the form of sound waves and arri eventually arrive in your ear and, that's, and that is the, set, the bang or the clap in my case. Um, so these... Um, if you're going to have a big bang, you have to have fluctuations because those would be the sound waves of the big bang. And to cut a very long story short, we now know that the, the early universe as indicated by this cosmic microwave background that I talked about before, CMB for short, um, wasn't totally uniform. And we can actually see the sound waves of the big bang. And this is a picture from the Planck satellite showing you that this is the whole sky, the temperature of the microwave radiation in different directions over the whole sky, and you'll see that it's not quite uniform. It's almost uniform. The fluctuations are one part in 100,000, but it's not quite uniform. And that means that, and those fluctuations are the sound of the Big Bang. So it really was a Big Bang. We know how loud the Big Bang was actually, by measuring the amplitude of these sound waves. It's not that loud, actually. It's something like 117 decibels. Like, actually, quite a lot of rock concerts are louder than that. Anyway, we can also analyze the, the, the spectrum of sound. Don't worry about the units here, but you'll see that there's a, uh, most of the energy in the microwave background fluctuations comes out at a particular scale, about one degree on the sky, but there are overtones on that. So it's actually got a, um, some structure uh, in terms of what the sound is. This isn't just white noise. It's, it's got notes in it, and fundamental and two harmonics, which we actually know some of. Now, from that, that uh, those measurements were made initially by the WMAP satellite and later on by Planck, starting about uh, uh, 15, 16 years ago. And now we know an awful lot about the beginning of the universe from, the set, from analyzing the sound. If you want to find out whether what's going on inside a container, you hit it and listen to the sound, right? If you, can, if you can't open it, you can have a look inside. So we now know 
have a very detailed model of the universe, which accounts for the cosmic web and a whole load of other things as well. But the price, uh, so let me just show you incidentally how the cosmic web forms. That's a picture of a computer simulation of this cosmic web structure in the middle of the distribution of galaxies. I'll just show you a quick flash of this movie. Um, so there's a universe which is almost uniform at the beginning. You see the redshift here is 20. And in this computer simulation, every particle here is acting on every other particle. And they naturally form clumps. And let me just move it, let it play very quickly. You notice the universe is expanding. You've got to imagine this box expanding as well. But you'll see how spontaneously gravity causes an almost uniform uh, universe to form uh, filaments and clumps very similar to the, to the uh, observed uh, structure of the universe. Okay, now we've got a price to pay for this wonderful model. We now have a standard model of cosmology. Most cosmologists think uh, we now understand the cosmic web, we understand the cosmic ma microwave background, we understand a lot of other things. We've had to pay a price for that though, because we've had to introduce some crazy ingredients into uh, the universe in order to account for it. So we have to have about 27% almost of the universe has to be in an exotic kind of matter that can clump very easily. Otherwise this mechanism does not produce galaxies like we think there are. Worse than that, 70% almost of the universe is in a form of uh, energy that we don't understand the slightest thing about. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Dark energy. Dark energy is revealed by latest cosmological observations by the fact that in, without dark energy, we would expect the expansion of the universe to slow down uh, gradually because matter is always pulling and you'd expect it to be a drag on the expansion. But observations suggest that that's actually not the case. The universe is actually accelerating. So there's got to be some source of energy that pushes it. Okay, so dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter, we might know a little bit about. Dark energy, we definitely don't know anything about. And uh, I'm not going to say any more about those, except that they're very active topics of research. Now, I'm nearly done. I just wanted to mention uh, that in next year, that around about this time next year, the European Space Agency will launch a satellite uh, called Euclid. It's uh, the name, um, uh, those of you who know anything about uh, classical geometry will know that Euclid's elements are the, uh, the famous uh, collection of theorems about, uh, gravity, uh, about um, ge the geometry. Um, uh, Euclid is actually a telescope. Uh, it's not a particularly big one. It's 1.3 meter diameter, but it has a fantastic camera on the back of the telescope, which is able, is sensitive enough and has sufficiently accurate optics to measure directly the uh, expansion rate and whether or not there's any evidence for dark energy and a whole load of other things about the universe and probe the cosmic web out to incredibly uh, high uh, redshifts. That will be launched next December. And Maynooth is the only university in Ireland that's actually involved in this experiment. So this is modern physics, it's big science. There are about 4,000 individuals around the world who are gonna be working on Euclid, a lot of them working now. Um, many building the telescope, but also people um, analyzing the data, which will take about six years to do. So this is a very exciting thing. Maybe we'll find out whether these ideas about dark energy and dark matter, and even whether Einstein's uh, theory of gravity are right, or whether the Big Bang model needs to be modified, we should be able to find out big clues from this. These are artists' impressions, of course, it's not been launched yet, it'll be launched uh, next year, hopefully, if all goes well. So, I'm, I'm just about on time. Uh, we have a standard cosmology, which I've described, it's based on Einstein's theory of gravity, um, but we don't know what the universe is made of. Uh, we think we know how it behaves, but in detail, we don't know uh, what dark energy is. What We know what properties we need to postulate for it to have, but we don't know where that comes from physically. So um, 
we have dark matter, dark energy, and Einstein's theory as our standard model, but it is entirely possible that we're wrong about this. Um, and that Einstein's theory is wrong, that there's no dark energy, there's something else. And maybe in the next six years or so with Euclid, we'll find out whether this is right um, or whether the whole framework will come uh, tumbling down. And in many ways, that's the most exciting thing that can happen in any branch of, branch of science that you discover that you have to start again with the theoretical side. I want to end on the point that many of the biggest problems in cosmology now uh, we've had all these technical discoveries like the microwave background, the probe Planck satellite measuring those fluctuations in the microwave background. We've had, uh, we've got Euclid, we've got all these, they're all great observational and technological developments, but they will eventually lead to a point possibly when, when the big problems are actually theoretical. We just have to rethink uh, the way we've been thinking about the universe. So it's a very exciting time to be working in this field. Uh, for both theorists and observational uh, people. So I'm going to end there. Uh, I'll stop sharing. That's just a gratuitous picture. And I think we're ready for John. Yeah, Peter, did you want to um, see if there was one question on your talk now? Like, I know we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the, the event, but did you want to see if there was one question that anybody had for you on that talk or anything like that? It's up to I you. don't think. Um, do we have a question? If anybody wants to ask a question for Peter, raise your hand there and we can uh, we can let one or two questions in before I before I start. Yeah, there's nothing in the Q&A, but if anyone yeah. wants to raise a hand. Seems, it seems not. Yeah. Okay, maybe we just. Uh, oh, there's one. There's one hand up. Will I go hunting first? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, why not? We'll take and see, see if I can answer it. Okay, see who's the brave person now. If I can find them. Oh yes. Oh, sorry, I lost them. Um, um we have Mount. Saint Michael Ross Carberry, I'm going to allow you to talk now, so you should be able to talk. Uh, you have to unmute there yourself. Yeah. Yep. Um, do, do we know what happens if they ever collide or like, have you ever seen that? If what collides? The galaxies. Oh yeah, Gal galaxies are colliding and merging all the time. In fact, the Andromeda galaxy, which I showed you in the picture there, it will actually collide in the Milky Way. Um, the, it's not quite uh, the kind of collision that you're used to because these are not very solid objects. There's a long uh, distance between the stars in the galaxy. So what happens is that they in interact gravitationally. The stars don't all collide with each other because they're very um, sparsely distributed in the galaxy. Um, but we'd think the basic way that a galaxy like uh, a large galaxy like the Milky Way formed from much smaller ones in the early universe um, by essentially merging uh, and interacting and gradually kind of smoothing out and so on and, and producing a, a galaxy. Uh, so it's what's called a hierarchical uh, galaxy formation. You start with little bits and they all interact with each other and, uh, with each other and, and gradually pile up. But we can definitely see images of galaxies which are in the process of colliding they interact with each other uh, tidily and they produce really spectacular patterns. Um, so they're actually rather beautiful thing to watch. If you're worried about the Andromeda galaxy colliding with our galaxy, you shouldn't be, because it'll take a, probably a couple of billion years before that actually happens. And uh, I'll be retired by then. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, is, is that okay, Mind St. Michael's, is that okay? I have one more question, Peter, if you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Shane Freeman, um, your hand is up. I'm going to, um, I've unmuted. Well, no, I, I've allowed you to talk. You have to unmute yourself there. Good to go, if Shane. Dark, if dark energy exists, wouldn't that break the loss of energy can be created or destroyed since eventually the expansion would stop, wouldn't it? Uh, no, no, it doesn't actually. The, the, um, dark energy is completely uh, compatible with all the laws of physics that we know. In fact, 
Um, it, the best, well, I'll say the best, it's not particularly a uh, great explanation uh, of what dark energy is, but it's generated in a vacuum by quantum processes. Those are to some extent uh, well understood and it doesn't violate any known physics there. In fact, the dark energy is not, we think that it's kind of been there for a very long time from the early universe and it does follow known laws of physics. Uh, it, it's probably worth saying that conservation of energy, which you get taught, you know, sort of leaving certain uh, level physics and in fact, at undergraduate level physics as well, is much a more complicated subject in general relativity than it is in uh, Newton's uh, concept. But I would say, no, the uh, dark energy doesn't violate any known laws of physics, but that still doesn't really mean they know, we know what it is. It has properties, uh, we think, um, that, that are, are consistent with physics, but we don't know where it comes from or how to explain it in terms of any other um, uh, theoretical ideas. So it's still a mystery. Brilliant, Peter. And I have to get this last one in if I can, because Dale Cunahan in Tralee, Edmund Rice, big shout out to you all there. I loved your tweet earlier. So I'm going to allow you to talk. So you have to unmute yourself there. Hi, how are you? Um, you okay. showed, showed a nice graphic earlier of gravity and um, causing, you know, particles in the early universe clumping together. And yeah. I suppose in leaving certificate, certificate, we know that gravity is an attractive force. Yes. We've been speaking about dark energy, which you think is obviously the most overriding powerful force in the universe. How do you see things going, you know, towards the end of time? You know, there's talk about it, the big rip, and because of dark energy. Is, is, is dark energy now the only thing, the only game in the land? Is it? Is it? Well, so I, I tried to uh, say something about this uh, at the end of my talk, but the, so we have, if we think Einstein was right with his general theory of relativity, then in order to explain the accelerating universe, you have to have some kind of exotic form of energy. So in Einstein's theory, energy gravitates, not just mass, so all forms of energy gravitate. And it's possible that you could um, have some con uh, content to the universe, which we call dark energy, that produces something that looks like a repulsive, a, a repulsive, repulsive force. Now, the alternative is to say, well, actually, there's none of this fancy dark energy malarkey. We've just got gravity wrong, and we modify uh, Einstein's theory uh, in such a way that gravity isn't always attracted. And there are lots of people working on those ideas. And that is one, these modified gravity theories are one set of theories that we hope Euclid will be able to probe and, and tell us whether they're right. Because all of these things uh, affect the universe in a slightly different way. Um, so yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, dark matter is attractive gravitationally, right? So it causes things to clump and that's, that's, that's common. We just don't know what it is, what particles it's made of. But dark energy has to do something very counterintuitive. It's possible with the laws of physics, but it's counterintuitive. Does that answer your question, Dale? Oh, I, I think, I'm sorry, I've un un All right, un well. Dale. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm late to talk there, Dale, to answer that. Oh, that's great, thanks a million. You're welcome. Now, I, I think we should, I've taken some of John's time up, so I think I should. All right, that's all right. Um, I, the other thing is, if, if people have other further questions, just. Yeah, put them in the Q&A box as well, and we, we'll get to them all probably, if, if not most of them, um, at the end as well. So all questions will be answered as best we can. Okay, I'll um, I'll go ahead now and I'll talk about uh, black holes for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, and I'll also start uh, back 100 years ago, similar to what Peter did. Um, so... So black holes um, have had an interesting history, I suppose. So they, they evolved out of Einstein's equations um, about 100 years ago. And initially, um, initially Einstein was very skeptical about these, uh, these things. He, he felt that it was more of a, a kind of a mathematical um, construct within his equations and not something very physical. And so initially, he was very disbelieving of this. And... It took a long time as well, even um, for the community to come around to it. So like Einstein's equations were there for a hundred years. People 
you know, believed in general relativity um, wholeheartedly. Um, but it was really only in the 60s, I would say, that black holes entered the mainstream. Um, and there had been, you know, Hawking had a famous bet, in fact, about, about uh, whether um, one of the first black holes that we found um, um, was actually going to be a, a black hole or not. So, um, so it, it had a kind of like a very much embryonic in, in, sense of, in terms of our understanding of black holes. But, but really, like uh, I put this um, slide up just to show like Einstein was probably, you know, like, you know, quite, it was incredible, really. Like he was, you know, front page news anytime that he had any theories coming out. This is very rare for a scientist. Very, very, very you rarely see a scientist making the front page uh, of newspapers. But Einstein had that ability, you know, he revolutionized our understanding uh, of the universe and of black holes as well. So that's why he entered Peter's talk and my talk. Um, so where, where do black holes come from, first of all? Um, so, so our standard model of black holes, which we, we believe pretty strongly in, is that black holes come from massive stars, okay? So, um, so first of all, if we look at the top part of this plot here, uh, first of all, you, most stars in galaxies are, are not massive. They're more like the size of our sun, so about one solar mass. Actually, it's more but less is the standard size. And if you're, if you're a star like our sun, what happens is you evolve into a red giant phase after about 10 billion years. Uh, the, the lifetime of a star depends on how massive it is actually. Um, so, but for a star about the mass of our sun, it evolves into a red giant star. So it puffs up, gets very big and very bright actually. And eventually then it'll turn into what's called kind of a misnomer of planetary nebula because that's what people thought they were initially, but they're not, they're just the end stages of a star. And then eventually into a, into a white dwarf star, which will then cool over eons essentially. And there are you know, white dwarfs, the white dwarf is what our sun will end as. And there are um, lots and lots of, of white dwarfs in the galaxy as well. So like, cause as you'd expect, because they're the end stages of a star. If we then move down to the bottom, though, um, if you do do end up with a massive star, so something uh, about ten times the size of the sun, maybe a little bit, little bit less, a little bit more, and we see stars up about a hundred solar masses, actually, uh, maybe one hundred and fifty or so on. So fairly massive, but they get rarer as 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 you look for more massive stars, you you, you find less of them. So it's a rarer um, event, similar to the way like that. You know, if you look for taller and taller humans, you just see less of them. They exist, but they're, you know, the, the number density falls off. Um, and at the end of their lifetime, then there can be a few pathways. Some of them can go, some of them can actually go and be, blow up as a supernova explosion. Them. Some of them uh, end up as a neutron star. So it's an incredibly dense star, very, very dense, held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. So that can't force neutrons any denser into each other, actually. Uh, and some of them then end up as, as a black hole. So that's where most of our black holes come from in the galaxy. Uh, and we kind of actually know how many of how many of these black holes there are in the galaxy, because we know how many stars there are, and we know how many massive stars there are. And therefore, we can tell how many black holes there are. So these are well-known kind of numbers. Now, we can't see them very easily because they're black. Um, so by definition, a black hole um, doesn't emit any light. And in fact, it captures all the light. And that's kind of why it's called a black hole. So it's a very good name for it. So most black holes are completely invisible to us and we'll never be able to find them. Um, they're just in the, in the galaxy, sitting there doing virtually nothing. Okay. And we'll never really be able to detect them because they're, they're for all intents and purposes, invisible. Okay. Um, I have a little movie now that I'm going to show, um, which goes through in some dramatic detail, how, a, how a black hole is born. <laughs> Our universe is full of stars. At the end of their lives, some die quietly. Others go out in spectacular explosions. And some give birth to black holes. If you have a star, a supermassive star, that's a hundred times the mass of the sun, at the end of its life, the core runs out of fuel. There's nothing left to hold it up and the core collapses down into a black hole. When that happens, the enormous gravity generated at the heart of supermassive stars runs wild. This is the dying star, V.Y. Canis Majoris. It's more than a billion miles across. Like all stars, 
It's a giant nuclear fusion reactor pumping energy outward. At the same time, the star's extreme gravity crushes inward. For a few million years, fusion and gravity are locked in standoff. But when the star runs out of fuel, fusion stops and the stalemate ends. Gravity wins. In a millisecond, the core shrinks to a fraction of its original size, and a baby black hole is born. Immediately, it starts to cannibalize what's left of the star. As matter swirls into the black hole, it gets incredibly hot, and there are magnetic forces and frictional forces, and it's just a witch's brew, a nightmare of what's going on right above the surface of the black hole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was a pretty cool video. So that kind of tells us exactly how a black hole forms, essentially the end state of a massive star. Okay. Um, so we're very lucky at the moment. Uh, we're kind of living through a bit of a golden age of um, a black hole discovery. So it's been quite a revolutionary 10 years, I would say, or at least the last five or six years. So back in 2015, actually, it was. Um, we had the first discovery of gravitational waves. So gravitational waves um, are emitted when two black holes merge together. Two black holes merge together is an incredibly violent event. Um, so if you could imagine two trains smash, you know, going headlong into each other at a, you know, 200 kilometers an hour, and they smash into each other. So they smash into each other at 400 kilometers an hour. And that's, you know, a very violent event. Black holes, when they merge, are traveling at half the speed of light when they hit each other. And these things are massive, okay? So the, the actual uh, energy involved is, is really enormous. So when you actually merge two black holes together, you essentially give three solar masses worth of energy into, into gravitation waves. Could you imagine that? That is absolutely enormous. And these things have hit each other at nearly the speed of light. So they are quite, um, quite powerful events. So it's so powerful, in fact, that they emit these gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves can travel enormous distances and then we can detect them. Now we tried for a long time to do this, you know, at least 25 years of experiments, getting more sensitive and more sensitive and more sensitive and failed, okay? Then in 2010, we upgraded for these, these instruments here. This is LIGO. Um, there's two of these instruments in the States. They both have arms perpendicular to each other and they essentially shoot laser beams down these arms and what they're trying to detect is any difference in the time of the arrival of the laser beams. Okay. If nothing is, if nothing, if everything is, is perfectly symmetric and in equilibrium, the laser beams arrive together. If not, though, if something knocks them out of equilibrium and one arrives before the other, something happened. Okay. And that something can be gravitational waves. So back in 2015, it was actually September 2015, the result was announced later in 2016, but in September 2015, um, it was during an engineering run, a test run, um, they detected the first gravitational wave and it really was at that level. Um, so they turned on the detector and there were some technicians monitoring the data and they got a signal. And, you know, first of all, they were like, probably nothing. And they couldn't find nothing, couldn't find nothing. They ruled out everything else. And they were left with the conclusion that they had detected gravitational waves. And so they had to ring up the directors and all this kind of stuff and get everybody in and figure it out. It turned out they had detected gravitational waves during the engineering cycle. It's quite incredible. Um, the arm lengths are four kilometers long. So you're bouncing, with, um, bouncing laser beams up and down, trying to detect these gravitational waves. And it's been revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary for the field. Um, LIGO, its arm lengths are long, four kilometers, but that's, it's not super long, right? Um, so it's good at detecting. So this is where LIGO is good. It's good at detecting gravitational waves from small black holes. So that's they, they have basically um, a higher frequency. So this is where LIGO is powerful. So it can only detect small black holes. It can't get to the monsters out here. These are the monstrous ones down here at lower frequencies. Um, so LISA is something that uh, I work on. Uh, LISA will be the Gravitational Wave Observatory in space. It'll be launched in about 10 years time, uh, which may seem like a long time, but in, in astrophysics or in, in a cosmological sense, that's a blink of an eye. Um, and the science is what we're working on now. Um, so this is this is, is promised to be another revolution in gravitational waves. 
And the good thing about gravitational waves is we understand um, the technology for under, for detecting gravitational waves now. So this this has become on very sure footing. ELISA actually was kind of something that cropped up about 10 years ago, probably as a result of the financial crash and our lack of detection of gravitational waves. Where things were scaled back. That's now been dumped again and we're back to full LISA um, because the technology is well understood. And the, you know it, this looks like a very, very um, sure way of detecting gravitational waves of the more massive ones. And then you can go to even the biggest black holes in the universe. Uh, these are the billion solar mass giants at the center of massive galaxies. For that, you need to go to even um, shorter wavelengths, shorter frequencies, smaller frequencies. Um, and then you need some other technology, usually pulsar timing arrays um, to do that. And that's this nanograv experiment. All right, so there's different, you need basically different instruments to detect different um, masses of black holes as they're emerging. And, and again, this is really the best way to detect black holes because they're invisible, uh, like a lot of the time, invisible to our telescope, so we can't see them. So we need another mechanism, gravitational waves, to detect them. Um, this is the, this has been what LIGO has been uh, brilliant at for our galaxy and, and some nearby galaxies as well, relatively nearby at least. So this is the um, the stellar graveyard. Okay, so this is what this is what um, LIGO has detected. These are all the black holes that LIGO has detected over the last uh, five or six years. So there are ninety mergers here. So it's quite incredible. Given we went start from went from zero, you know, five or six years ago to ninety now. Um, so it's we're almost at one a month. So it's been revolutionary for the field. Um, we've detected as well neutron star mergers as well. That's the uh, the yellow ones down here. So this is this is this is very important as well because they do then have an electromagnetic signature as well. So you can combine the measurements, so-called multi-messenger uh, astrophysics. So that's been, um, been huge as well. And we've detected quite large black holes. This is probably the limit of where LIGO gets up to about 200 solar masses, but it really is populating out this plot. Like um, there are other ones available where we show like the, the ones that black holes that have been detected just through normal telescopes, optical telescopes or X-rays. And there's a fraction of this size, you know, over decades. So like this just shows you the revolution that we've, we've undergone. So it's been, been quite incredible, actually. Um, yeah, just uh, the last thing on, on black holes or nearby black holes, I think, is um, so there's a black hole at the center of our own ga uh, galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, so like I said, for there are lots of black holes in the Milky Way, but this one's the biggest at the center, the central supermassive black hole. It's about a million solar masses, a little bit more. And to detect that, what we do is, so you're looking at nothing again. So you have to figure out how to detect something when you can't see it. And what we do is we look at what are called the S stars in the Milky Way. So this, this was a movie uh, made by Andrea Gay's team in uh, UCLA. Um, and they won the Nobel Prize for these measurements uh, about uh, two years ago. And they see the stars moving around essentially nothing. And you can see these stars do really kind of like funky orbits because they're like busily being uh, like a slingshot around nothing. And that nothing is a, is a 4 million solar mass black hole at the center of our, um, our, our galaxy. And most massive galaxies, if not all massive galaxies, harbor a supermassive black hole. Okay, I'll just keep going in the, in the interest of time. It's fun to watch these things all day. Um, so somebody actually asked in the chat about these pictures of a black hole. Um, so I did tell you black holes were invisible. So. I have to be careful not to trip over myself. Um, but they, so they are, a black hole is invisible. Um, but if there is matter spiraling into a black hole, it can heat up. It heats up through um, what are kind of like quasi-frictional forces, it's not actual friction because the, the densities are too low actually. So we believe there are magnetic fields which are driving this uh, accretion disk around the black hole, okay? So if you have matter falling into a black hole, you've got a very, very, very bright accretion disk. It's incredibly bright. And it's so bright, in fact, that we can see black holes across the entire observable universe. Um, so they really are very, very bright objects, which is lucky for us, otherwise we, of course, never see them. So these were measurements made by a, um, a band, for want of a better word, of telescopes right around the world over the course of about um, 10 years, it's called the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, so you can see here, it starts in 2009, I think, and you see the pictures they were taking up. This is the M87 galaxy. So it's a it's relatively nearby, very massive galaxy with a super massive black hole at the center. Um, the, the black hole at the center of this galaxy is, is a billion solar masses. So a thousand times bigger than the, the Milky Way black hole. So and one of the, the largest black holes um, 
that we know about, very, very massive. Um, and what happened was we took essentially um, grouped telescopes together to make an interferometer, okay, which uh, with an equivalent size of, of the size of the Earth. So you basically take telescopes from around the world, point them at this uh, black hole, not, not constantly now, but whenever you get time, and then you take the signals for each, each individual telescope and you add them together. And what that does is it gives you a, an effective telescope, which is the size of the Earth. And, the, and the, so initially back in 20, uh, 2009, the observations were quite noisy. And then <clears throat> over, over time, over the years, new telescopes came online, uh, particularly ALMA, where's ALMA? ALMA here, the Atacama, a large uh, millimeter array um, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, which is a very, very good place. It's high up and the air is very dry very good for taking measurements and that increased the sensitivity of these event horizon uh, observations dramatically and it was using really alma plus all the other telescopes that we were able to take this image the first ever image of a black hole so the black hole is the, basically the black bit at the very center and what's around it then is you see the accretion disk that's the the matter falling into the black hole and that's very very bright so the, there was two black holes that we looked for this one M87 and the one at the center of our own uh, galaxy, the Milky Way, trying to image that as well. We haven't been able to image the one at the, the Milky Way yet because it's smaller. And so the gas is actually traveling faster and that's harder to image. OK, so we're still working on that. People are still doing the data analysis for this. It's very, very hard. Like there are telescopes as well in the South Pole. Uh, I can see, uh, I'm not sure if any of them are on that. Um, and like the data is so big, you have to send a plane down. And it has to basically bring new hard drives down and you fly the other ones back out. Um, so it's a very, it is non-trivial stuff. Um, but if you um, if you do become an astronomer in the future, you'll get to go to cool places to take observations like the South Pole and, and Chile, uh, which are, you know, spectacular environments. Um, so yes, so I'm just gonna quickly finish up there because I know I'm way over time, though I, I blame Peter. Um, so, when we come, when you come to study um, astrophysics or, um, or or general relativity or something like that at university, you'll be met with things like the Einstein field equation. So this is what Einstein wrote down a hundred years ago, and he he revolutionized our understanding because he brought the the bending of space time, bending of gravity, into his equations. So this is this is so this is the Einstein e field equation here, and on the on the left hand side we have like the curvature of space time the cosmological constants this dark energy that peter talked about and then we need source terms so some sort of matter something that can bend space time bend space time is really stiff like very very stiff um like we need you need like you know smash black holes together to bend space time so it's really really is stiff but you can do it uh and that's what that's what gr tells us um so if you do come to study undergraduate uh physics or at university or Newt or, or wherever, you, you get introduced to all these concepts, special relativity, uh, astrophysics, physical cosmology, the dark energy, the universe models that Peter talked about, dark matter, quasars, which are these very bright accreting black holes, general relativity, you get introduced to Einstein's equations, the bending of space time, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of very, very interesting physics. I suppose the other thing is like, we're definitely going through a kind of a, like a really golden age in, in terms of black holes and and cosmology as well. You know, we have these new new satellites going up. We're taking more and more information all the time. Information is key. Guides our theories, um, and that's that's really where we're at at the moment. So it's been been a been a very exciting very exciting time. And Peter will say that as well. Um, so Misha may talk a little bit more about this, but there's a a minute um, virtual open day um, <clears throat> towards the end of this month more than welcome to, to obviously join that um, as well as that if, if people have questions um feel free to email me at any time you know about any of these things especially on the physics side of it and or you know if you're in minute pop in you know more than welcome to talk to prospective students um so my last slide this is not my last slide my last slide is a quiz um so you can win a tablet uh, if you're clever um so there's three questions um first one is what is the cmb so i think peter already gave that one away um, so I've talked to Peter about that. Um, the second one is black holes are defined by three characteristics. What are they? Um, some people might already know that. And the, la the last one is, 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 is a bit of a devilish question, actually. Um, so LIGO, again, this detector, um, say we're to detect a one solar mass black hole, 
Okay, so it hasn't done that yet. Um, detected small neutron stars, this is true, but would it, what would happen if it detected one solar mass black hole? What would that tell us about our theories? So answers, uh, and it was by email to me. Uh, if you put master of class competition in the subject line, I'd appreciate that. Allow me to filter the emails a little bit easier. You have to CC your teacher um, so that for your entry to be valid, so that we know what's coming from the school. And it's open basically over the weekend. Um, so we'll close it on Monday. And I will announce the winner on Tuesday. Okay, that's it. Uh, I'll leave that slide up. And I think I think we're going to take a 10 minute break. Isn't that right, Ida? Yeah, um, do you want to take a 10 minute break? And I will pause recording and resume recording at 10 past 11. So um, classes can keep on the webinar in the background or you can rejoin us, um, but I will pause recording now. Yeah, and, 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 is that okay? Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, please put them in the, the Q&A as well. Um, and we'll answer them in the Q&A in the, the Q &A session at the, at the very end, um, either by Perfect. text or, or live. Thanks million, guys. Okay, see you at 10 past 10 sharply. So stretch your legs, grab a cup of tea, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Delivery. I'm just starting the recording. Thank God you're still there. I was afraid I was going to have to deliver the next session. Um, it's great. Just before I start, there is questions in the Q&A, but we're having great um, photos sent to us on Twitter. So if schools are out there and they want to tag us on, it's at Maynooth CAO. And with that, I will hand over to John or Peter. Yeah, I think Lucy, actually. Do you want to take it away, Lucy? Sorry, Lucy. No worries. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. Yeah, that looks perfect. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me as well. Um, so my name is Lucy. I'm 23 and I'm a student here in Maynooth, and I'm going to talk to you about my university experience so far and how I got here, um, and just kind of reminding everyone that it's not always um, straightforward, and you can change your mind, and what you start off with isn't necessarily what you're going to finish with. Um, so I'm in my final year, and um, I'm doing a Bachelor of Science in Mathematical Physics and Statistics. And um, so I'm doing a double major. So I study both of those subjects equally. Um, so before I came to Maynooth, I really liked physics and maths for the Leaving Search. They were my favorite subjects. And um, so when I uh, applied to the CAO for 2017, I wanted to do astrophysics. Um, so I started that, um, but I realized then that it wasn't 100% me. And um, so I left after two months, I dropped out of college. Um, I got half my fees back um, and I decided to take the year out um, and reconsider what I wanted to do. So I worked in an engineering firm for the rest of the year. Um, which was really good experience for me. Um, I got to work in an office environment. Um, I learned AutoCAD, which is um, kind of 2D design for architects and engineers. Um, and that was really beneficial to me because it meant that I could have um, a good job during the summers of every year um, and, and not have kind of the classic job that everyone else has. Um, and I also, in that year, I did maths grinds with a lot of my friends that were the year behind me. So um, I decided I was going to apply to CAO again and do maths education. So I started maths education in 2018 in Maynooth. And I really enjoyed the science aspect of it. And I was doing um, mathematical physics maths, experimental physics, and computer science, um, along with education as well. But I kind of discovered that education might not be for me again. Um, and so uh, in the summer of first year, 
I thought uh, I would drop that and enter MH201, which is general science. Um, so I went ahead and I entered general science in second year. And my three subjects were maths, mathematical physics, and experimental physics. Um, and actually a really cool thing about general science in Maynooth is that you get to do an elective, which um, means that you get to study something that's completely unrelated to your degree. So I, I did an elective in global environmental change, which is all about climate change um, and the causes of climate change and what we can do to uh, fix climate change and what we can expect to happen if, if we don't. Um, and that was really interesting for me. And I got to go and see what the Department of Geography is like, because I've never been in that department. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And it, it did actually tie in with the physics as well, because there's a lot of physics involved um, kind of atmospheric physics in the science of climate change. So that was really, really interesting for me. Um, and then I entered third year. So this would have been last year for me. And I started off again in general science. And I was doing two subjects this time. Uh, I was doing pure maths and mathematical physics. Um, however, two weeks into third year, I was a little bit unsure of what I was uh, doing. Um, and I'd had a really great lecturer in statistics in second year, Dr. Raphael. Um, he's, he's really great. He's here in Manu. And um, I started to do more research into working in statistics or data analysis. Um, and I, I emailed and I, I asked, could I change to statistics instead of pure maths, um, which is kind of an unusual degree, but um, it's two subjects that I really like. So I, I did that for the rest of third year. Um, and for me, third year was completely online with COVID, um, which wasn't ideal, but um, I really enjoyed the subjects that I was doing. Um, so enter final year, which I started about six weeks ago. Um, and this is the only year that I have not changed my mind on what I'm doing. Um, so I'm finally in a place where I'm really happy with my degree. Um, and uh, it's exactly what I want to do. And I've really, I suppose I've, in changing my mind every year, I've come up with something that I really like and something that works for me. So I'm going to graduate in 2022, hopefully. And um, I think I want to do a master's in data science in Berlin um, or some kind of master's in statistics and uh, become a data scientist or a statistician um, and both the subjects that I'm doing this year are are really really helpful and that I've got a great maths background with doing maths physics and I've got loads of coding and loads of stats with doing statistics here in Maynooth so um, yeah it's perfect for me um, and I suppose I, I just wanted to remind everyone that your university degree is for you and uh, it's what you make it and that's the the great thing about doing a degree like general science or um arts and minute you can choose subjects that really work for you that wouldn't normally be in a degree together um so yeah if there's any questions do leave them in the q a um well, I think that's it for me. Um, I'm not sure if Peter or John want to continue on. I'm just going to jump in there for a yeah. second, Lucy, before um, John and Peter come back in. Um, I, I thought that was inspirational. Um, and I think it's a huge benefit to our Leave Insert students or those in fifth year or fourth year considering their CEO and probably it's on their mind from the first of February yeah. approaching and I just I think your story is inspirational because of you did get your preferred course on your CEO you withdrew from that other university which was in Maynooth and took that year out and you know sometimes it you have to be 
brave and courageous because yeah. you know people are afraid am I going to disappoint my parents I'm going to disappoint whoever but you took that bold brave decision within the first mm-hmm. couple of weeks in that other institution to say yeah. you know what I need to take a year out I need to reassess and I just love hearing your story because sometimes we just hear stories from those with the 600 pointers and you get your first choice in summer and everyone thinks oh we're living the dream and we need to hear yeah. stories like like uh, you and um that there is a pathway for everyone and yeah. don't be afraid if you know in next September or maybe it'll be late September next year if you're not happy go and talk to someone in the university because mm-hmm. like Lucy there's a path for everyone so yeah. sorry I'm taking up time but I just had to jump in there and and say that and I loved listening to you thank you Lucy thank you very much thanks um do you want to stop sharing uh the the thing now uh, lucy i think i so on that note i thought what i would do is just um give you a quick very quick overview of um the ways that you can study um the topics that we've talked about here and indeed other topics at maynooth and i think uh let me just do that um i'll share this slide just a very quick one. Um, and I think this, this basically <laughs> follows on very naturally from uh, Lucy's talk because um, there are many ways of studying uh, uh, theoretical and mathematical physics at Maynooth. Um, and we pride ourselves on the flexibility of all our programs actually. And that, uh, see Lucy's been a beneficiary of that. Um, but in some sense, the, the kind of, flip side of being flexible is that it can appear very complicated because you have lots of choices that you can make and and so on. So I just wanted to mention a couple of uh, points that just to bear in mind. Um, First of all, uh, here in Maynooth, we have kind of two names for the same thing. Um, John and I work in the Department of Theoretical Physics. Uh, I'm actually the head of that department. Um, But very often we refer to uh, mathematical physics as the subject that we teach. And that's for historical reasons, but basically don't be confused by that at all. uh, Mathematical physics and theoretical physics are basically the same thing as far as we're concerned. So don't think it's, it's a, that's a complication. It's just a historical thing. It may, you may be interested to know actually uh, a long time ago, over a hundred years ago, um, uh, the head of the Department of Mathematical uh, of Mathematics and Mathematical Physics at Maynooth University uh, was a guy called Eamon de Valera. And he was head of the department for one year uh, before he went and did other things. Um, and at that time, mathematical physics was part of the Department of Mathematics, hence the this, this synergy between mathematics and, and, and physics. Now we're our own department um, and it's called theoretical physics. That's just names, right? So don't be confused by them. Um, the other thing is to go through the just quickly through the various ways that you could study the subjects that we've been talking about and others. Um, Lucy mentioned uh, our general science program, which is we sometimes call it the omnibus science, because um, you basically can study any scientific discipline within that or combination of disciplines and then gradually specialize as you go on. So. Um, General science actually includes options in biology and chemistry, uh, physics, uh, uh, mathematics, you know, you name it. Everyone has to do mathematics, but but there's a a range of other options. Now, in Maynooth, we have two physics departments. We have the theoretical physics department, which we're both, John and I are both from, but we also have an experimental physics uh, department, um, which is why those two subjects came up in Lucy's talk. we teach theoretical physics and the experimental physics department teaches um, uh, uh, experimental physics. And you can do both. And we would encourage you to do both because uh, physics is a discipline that involves both theory and uh, experiment uh, and each in, informs and interacts with the other. Um, so in general, so if you want to study physics, uh, you have to make sure uh, if you want to do the full Monty, if you choose general science, you should pick both mathematical physics and experimental physics in the first year. And then you can gradually decide which side of the subject you want to go on to. 
Um, and uh, we have subject students who end up doing totally uh, mathematical physics uh, or like Lucy, 50-50 uh, with another subject uh, statistics. Incidentally, let me just say that I don't think statistics and mathematical physics is a strange combination at all. I didn't say this explicitly in my talk, but there's a heck of a lot of statistics in analyzing astronomical and cosmological data. And the, the cosmological community, community is full of people who are experts in data science. In fact, it's quite difficult to keep them because they keep getting offered jobs, earning a lot more money, uh, doing things in financial services and so on. So there's a, there's a side benefit. So let me just go quickly on uh, MH204 is another option. That's kind of uh, the first year is very similar to the first year of general science, but it involves um, uh, of astrophysics with an emphasis on observational and instrumentation astro uh, astronomy, and that's mostly taught by experimental physics. But you can do a full set of mathematical physics with that as well. And we have students doing PhDs in mathematical physics who actually did physics with astrophysics. So if you're sure you want the astrophysics, do MH204, but make sure that when you get your choices in the first year, you do mathematical physics as well, because that will give you the, the general relativity and all the other theoretical bits. We also have a, a denominated program inside uh, the theoretical physics department, which is a joint uh, uh, major from uh, day one. It's different from these two. It's theoretical physics and mathematics. And that's uh, our highest um, uh, CEO offers. It's 500 and something points. I can't remember exactly what this year. So that's a fast track program. It's a three year bachelor's program. And um, that has a, a, a group of students who are very keen right from the outset to do theoretical physics and maths and don't need any choices. But that's, you know, uh, a small minority of uh, students actually are that keen uh, or that sure at the beginning that they know what they want to do, as Lucy has described. And there's nothing at all wrong with saying, well, I'll try four subjects in the first year and decide what we're going to do. Anyway, that's just a guide to the names. That's not exhaustive, by the way because you can actually do uh, mathematical physics through our general arts program as well. Uh, so you can get a BA in mathematical physics if you choose. Um, that might surprise you, um, but actually my degree is a Bachelor of Arts degree in theoretical physics, not from this university, but from another one. So it's not, it's not at all unusual. It's, uh, it's just a question of which other subjects you might want to study alongside mathematical physics earlier on. Anyway, I'll cut this short now because we have, coincidentally, an open day, uh, which is actually spread over two days, a Friday and a Saturday, but there's a live webinar on the Saturday one where a um, member of the theoretical physics department and experimental physics will be um, explaining how to do physics at Maynooth. So you can, the link is there um, and all the details where you have to register for it and there'll be a question and answer there as well. So. That's the place to ask detailed questions, I think, about, you know, admissions procedures and various choices and things like that. But that's what all I wanted to say um, about physics, uh, theoretical and mathematical physics in, the, in Maynooth. There's a whole load of ways of doing it. And um, that's intended to give you the flexibility to tailor the course the way you want it or to try, try it in the first year and then maybe try some other things and decide. It. I should say, incidentally, I started at, at my undergraduate degree was a long time ago, obviously, but um, it was a similar program. It was called Natural Sciences, and I had to do four subjects in the first year. And my intention when I went to university was to do chemistry. But I had to do physics and mathematics and another subject in the first year. And at the end of the first year, I decided that I liked physics way more than I liked the chemistry. Uh, um, and then uh, I actually ended up within physics doing theoretical physics. So my journey was uh, not straight, straightforward either. I was fully intending to be an organic chemist when I started, and I'm very far from being either of those uh, uh, organic chemists now. Anyway, that's enough of that. I think I'll stop sharing this now. Um, and maybe we can have some question, it's question and answer stuff. So if anyone has any questions, Ita, can you keep an eye out for um, hands going up if there are? Um, there's one. I will. And there's a good few already in the chat box. Um, and yeah, So I'll answer one. Because the thing is that I, I will um, 
I will have to go promptly at quarter two because I've got a lecture coming up. Some of us have work to do. Uh, and uh, there's one question uh, in the chat, which is, uh, will we ever get our hands on strange matter, exotic matter or dark matter, or be able to observe dark energy and study it? Um, so that, that is, uh, that, that's relating to my talk. So I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, yeah, uh, so there's certainly a lot of experimental work to try and directly detect the particles of dark matter. If they're everywhere in the universe, they will be inside our galaxy, they will be inside our solar system, and they will be inside this room. The question is, how do we detect them? Because dark matter basically doesn't interact with light um, uh, or radiation of any kind. So you really need to uh, work very hard to detect it. There's been attempts to create dark matter particles at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, and they've not been successful. Uh, and all the attempts to directly detect dark matter have uh, failed so far, um, but they, it's hard to detect, and it may be just that we're not clever enough to detect it. Uh, the dream is certainly to identify some particle that, that is responsible for this, this dark matter um, that we see. Uh, as for dark energy, that's even harder because its effect is only seen on cosmological scales. But there are some interesting uh, research uh, air, um, activities going on in dark matter, uh, in dark energy, uh, that have suggested the possibility of very clever ex experiments that could be done on a tabletop, which would tell us if dark energy actually exists. They haven't actually been done yet. But I think that, that question does raise the key question about a scientific theory, is that it's not really a theory unless you can test it. So. We can invent dark matter and we can say um, this is what accounts for the fact that galaxies form and the cosmic web forms and all of that stuff. But you can't just stop there. You have to say, well, if it is dark matter that's doing that, what else should we be able to see? And uh, if we don't see it, does that rule out dark matter? So if it's matter, it should exist and have properties and we need to target experiments at directly identifying it. And those are underway. And at the moment, the, the, the uh, dark matter is the uh, um, uh, is the best model we have, although we don't know what it is. It's just dark. It's not dark, actually. I think basically it doesn't interact with radiation. So it's kind of transparent matter, really, rather than dark. Uh, now, uh, should I do another one? Um, there's a good one there at the bottom, Peter, for you. Uh, do antiparticles oh. fall upwards? Well, actually, no, they don't. They fall downwards because they um, the mass is positive. So it's uh, antiparticles still have positive mass. They have and a, a positron, which is an anti-electron, has the same mass as an electron. So it feels the same gravitational field. Um, so they don't fall upwards unless um, you're in Australia. <laughs> Yeah, I think what we, we, can, we can create coarse antimatter, right? Yes, yeah. So antimatter is uh, so the, it may well be that dark energy has something to do with uh, the creation of uh, matter antimatter uh, pairs on, on a very short time scale, and the quantum physics of it may be, but that doesn't mean that they have anti gravity. Uh, at all they're, they're actually the same they just have a different electrical charge and different other properties but the same mass yeah that's right and yeah and so what peter is saying there about the um the pairs is is, is i guess the vacuum energy that peter talked about in his talk as well yeah. could, could be could be a solution for and that would be einstein's cosmological constant there uh, there's a couple of ones here at the top i can do um about what happens to matter that goes into a black hole and do planets and uh, do stars and planets orbit the center of the supermassive black hole. So when a when matter goes into a black hole, the black hole grows. So that's how black holes grow. As they consume matter, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's that's how they get bigger across cosmic time as well. Inside the black hole is is tricky. That's beyond our science. And um, so we don't really know what happens inside a black hole. OK, it's black because light can't escape. It, it, the, essentially, the escape velocity of a black hole exceeds the speed of light. So we can never get information from inside a black hole. It's locked away from the, the rest of the universe. Um, so inside a black hole is, is tricky to understand. Um, that's, that's still beyond our science, um, although people 
put a lot of effort into, work, into working on those kind of um, answers to those questions. Uh, stars and planets, absolutely. Do they do, uh, orbit the center of supermassive black hole? Yes. Yeah. So, um, no, so for example, um, the sun, if the sun were to just turn into a black hole, nothing would happen the planetary orbits. We would still continue to orbit that, um, that central mass. Okay. So you can just think of that as mass and then the planets are in orbit around it. Um, so there's nothing like obviously it would be disastrous for life if if a black hole replaces the sun because we'd no longer get any heat or light and um, so we would you know that would be very very bad but the planets would stay in orbit so the orbital dynamics wouldn't change at all and there was one other question that was related to that about why don't um yes why do planets and stars not fall into the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, but instead orbit it. It's because this, they, they have this orbital energy. So the planets have this orbital energy that's causing them to move around. If they're, if the velocity of the, of the Earth, for example, were to somehow be affected or slow down, then our orbit would change. Um, so, and then we would move closer to the black hole. So what you're actually touching on there though, is a very, very interesting question. So often the question that I try to answer is how do black holes grow? Um, so you might think, oh, well, this is trivial because matter just flows into it. It is and it isn't. So for in order for matter to get into a black hole, it needs to lose orbital energy, lose angular momentum. So it needs to fall in, essentially. If it can't lose that uh, angular momentum, it just gets stuck in the orbit. And often that's the problem we encounter. Black holes, as they're uh, orbiting each other, you know, at some level, we'd love them to, to merge together and there's great gravitation, gravitation waves. And this would tell us a lot of information. The problem often is they get stuck. They just get stuck orbiting each other. There's nothing to extract energy. Nothing to. We need to extract energy from that system so that the, the, the binary can harden and the black holes can merge. And often there's no mechanism that we know of that extracts that energy. Or if it is happening, we don't understand why it's happening. So, so I'm sorry. There's a long answer to a to a short question of like, if nothing else changes and the orbit is the way it is, then that's the way it stays. So something needs to needs to happen, some external influence. Um, do you want to take a, another one, Peter? Can I just add a little bit to the, the answer to the first question that you did, John, which is, which is actually just to point out that because it's the same theory, general relativity, um, the question of what happens in the very middle of a black hole it is in many ways equivalent to the question of what happened at the Big Bang when the universe was infinitely compressed, because we don't know because we, we don't know the properties of matter under these extreme compression thing. Uh, it's called a singularity. Um, so the mathematics tells you the answer is infinite, but we know that when, uh, if we do a calculation and our calculator says it's infinite, we, we've screwed up basically, and we, we haven't done the right maths. So everyone thinks um, that we'll have to replace our description of matter or our description of gravity or both, uh, under these very, very extreme conditions of compression of matter added the Big Bang. The Big Bang is a kind of time reverse of the collapse to a black hole. I see it's expanding from a, uh, uh, an infinite state rather than collapsing to one, but mathematically they're equivalent. And we just don't have the physics to, to be able to describe those. So there are big gaps in our knowledge. Um, and there, so it's actually the Big Bang itself we don't understand because that's the point of infinite compression. And it's actually the black hole that we don't understand because that, in a sense, is the, the, the singularity. Um, we can, you know, understand what goes on around and hopefully lead to an understanding of those eventually, but we don't have that crucial understanding that makes it complete, which is being incomplete is why it's interesting and why people are asking questions about it, of course. Now let's have a look in the Q&A to see if there are any more questions. There's some great questions. Um, let's see. There's some about the course here. What are So there's a question from Castle Knock. Uh, what are the job opportunities with theoretical physics? Um, that's an interesting one um, because as I, I think I alluded to that uh, in uh, earlier comment about the course. Um, so the, the interesting thing about theoretical physics is that, um, and especially astrophysics and cosmology, is that there's a lot of physics in them, uh, those subjects. Then you have to put together a whole load of different kinds of ways of working. Um, computational models, John and I both showed computational results, so we need to know 
how to use high powered computers very often. We need statistical reasoning in order to understand the data. We need mathematical modeling and we need problem solving skills. And those, those uh, uh, skills are all uh, highly sought after, especially in Ireland, because we have a digital economy, basically. There's, there's uh, a huge emphasis on, on, uh, on digital skills. So the answer to what can you do with a degree in mathematical or theoretical physics is, is almost anything. Um, our students very, of, very often go off uh, and get high paying jobs afterwards in uh, data analytics or um, in mathematical modeling to do with financial services, insurance modeling and other kinds of risk uh, based uh, activities and so on. Um, uh, I, I should say that depending on which program we're talking about, about half of our students actually love it so much that they stay on to do uh, another degree, uh, advanced degree, masters or PhD or both, and carry on in research afterwards. Um, financial services, another one, but of course, education. Uh, if you do theoretical physics uh, at Maynooth, uh, then you're a shoe in for being an applied mathematics teacher which is a, a, there's a bit of a shortage of those in Ireland. So education is another one. But um, in, if you go to the, uh, if you attend the open day talk, you'll be able to see a list of destinations of our uh, recent uh, students, anonymized, of course, we're not allowed to use names, but uh, you name. So the interesting thing about physics is probably the opposite to what you imagine, that if you do a degree in engineering, you will end up by doing engineering, right? You do a job in engineering of some sort. If you do physics, you can do anything afterwards. I mean, it's not really prescriptive in that sense at all. The skills you get are unique and highly sought after. And uh, basically all our, all our graduates um, go off and, and get jobs. Some stay in physics and research and really love doing that, but others take those skills and contribute to the, uh, the wider society and economy. So uh, the answer is, um, it's not a narrow range at all. It's very broad. These days in the workplace, you have to be very flexible and you have to have the ability to learn quickly new, ch new things. And I think that's what physics teaches you to do. Yeah, I, I'd like to add a little bit to that as well. Um, so I did, a, did an undergraduate in theoretical physics and then I did a, a master's in high performance computing. And then, then I went on to do a PhD in astrophysics, but I then went to work for Intel um so and it was that base level of basically problem solving mathematical skills and computational uh skills that you know i was able to go into these different roles fairly easily um and that's what the kind of like the great thing about a, a physics degree or a science degree and probably with some computing in there as well it gives you this kind of base level and you're not restricted at all so like i had you know plenty of my colleagues who were um did undergraduate degrees with me some of them went into accounting actuary um some went on to do further physics um some into computing so there was all this kind of wide range of things they could do and they were in no way locked in and really only decided this at the end you know for for the first three or four years of your undergraduate you're just essentially enjoying your life right and you're, you're enjoying your science and you're enjoying your uh, university uh, life as well so it has this base knowledge um so i i think that's a really strong strong aspect of, of that kind of a degree. Um, so do, uh, I've answered a few of these in the chat just with uh, with text uh, replies. Oh, OK. Uh, John, uh, do you have any hobbies? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. Should we get into that? I might answer that in the text. Um, <laughs> So there's a good one here about is there any uh, plan or point into trying to send some kind of telescope into a black hole? So that's a good question. The problem is you never get the signal back, okay? Because you could imagine sending a camera into a black hole. That'd be great fun, right? Um, but then even if it still worked inside the black hole, the signal could never get out because, again, light is trapped inside. Um, so you could never get anything out of the black hole. So this is a problem. So we can only ever, that's why, you know, those images I showed you um, where they took a picture of the black hole, they took a picture of the accretion disk. The black hole is black, can't get any information out of that. Um, and there are also a lot of um, issues as well when we try to take, uh, if we try to get information out of a black hole, 
the information paradox. Um, so there are, there are issues there. Um, so it's nearly as well off that, <coughs> sorry, it's nearly as well off there is an event horizon. It essentially locks that black hole off from the rest of the universe. Um, so no, it's difficult, impossible at the moment, as our understanding of physics is, is at that level. Um, there's a question here maybe for, for Lucy, was it difficult to change courses? It was difficult in terms of the fact that I worked so hard for two years doing my viewing cert and then got to college and realized this is not all it's cracked up to be. So it's more difficult in that sense of being disappointed. Um, but uh, in, oh, but terms, what, what, in terms of I, logistics, are changing courses within Minute? In, within mm -hmm. college, within Minute, no, it wasn't difficult at all. No. So there's, a great, there's a great admissions team in Manusia. Yeah, University. they're fantastic. Yeah. Big, big shout out to the admissions yeah. team in Manusia. No, but seriously, if anyone, and that's back to what my point earlier, if you start any university and you find within the first few months or weeks that it isn't for you, just don't leave. Go and talk to some people because there is other avenues. And Lucy, that's why I'm so delighted to hear your talk. And I found it inspirational. But the, the keynote there is there's ways into yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. Are there people there to help anyway and make life easy? Don't make it tough on yourself. And I could really identify, Lucy, what you were saying. It was tough on you. Yeah. yeah. But that's what I was saying earlier about the courage that it took uh, you to do that. And look, you're happy now. So yeah, definitely. I think if, if I can just add something, I think there's a tendency sometimes for students to think that it's a it's, they've kind of failed in some way if they don't carry on with the thing that they intended at the start. But it's quite the opposite, actually. And the reason why we have such flexible degree programs is that we know that students don't always know exactly what they want to do and can change their minds. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, there's no point in doing a degree if you know that it's not for you, then why continue with it? Why not just make use of the flexibility that exists? And, um, you know, we have many change uh, one to another, uh, one thing to an, an, another, and in fact, several times as Lucy has done. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Nobody thinks the worst for any student who makes the choice. They, I mean, we wouldn't have this program the way it was if we thought that that was a bad thing to do. Um, I think the other thing worth mentioning here, I think, is that um, if you if you apply to do the general science program from the outset, MH201, then you don't even have to choose what four subjects you do in the first year until you arrive at the university. So you enroll for the you, you get onto the course and then you can arrive uh, arrive and say, well, I actually do I'll do uh, uh, physics, uh, experimental physics, chemistry, biology, and math. Well, you have to do maths. That's you have, everyone has to do basic maths in the first year but i'm sure a lot of students don't make their mind up as to what uh, subjects they're going to take in that discipline until they arrive and they hear people talking about their, their subject so that's fine as well it's not wrong to tailor your degree to your own interests and uh, aptitudes it's not wrong at all we encourage it but uh, I'm going to have to get ready for my, because I have a lecture coming up and I have to get to another building in order to give it. So um, I'm going to bail out now. So thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. I will answer, uh, if there's any that I've not answered so far, I'll try and answer them by email or so on. Um, of course, um, John and uh, Lucy and Ito can stay uh, as long as you have questions, but I have to go now, sorry. Uh, Thanks so much, Peter. Thank, thank you so much. Um, it was an amazing masterclass again, and I think even um, more questions this time. So uh, on behalf of Science Week at Maynooth University, thanks very much to yourself and John for putting this on and to Lucy um, again. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop recording. It is 11.48. Um, I, I, I'll just stop recording. Schools are uh, welcome to stay on, John. Have you got another five minutes, John and Lucy? Yeah, I can answer a couple more questions. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stay on um, for another five minutes. I'm, I'm going to stop the, the recording now. All right. Thanks, Peter. Enjoy your class, Peter. It won't be as engaging as this, will it? <laughs> uh, um...